good uh, evening, everybody. Um, so, so one fact you might not know is that um, it is proven scientifically that Google changes the way your brain works. Um, and our next speaker will be sharing some uh, information about how that is. And the challenge today is that um, we're interacting with a lot of different technologies, websites that we've become dependent on, but we're not always aware how that's changing uh, uh, our brains. Now, our next speaker has been coding since she was young, uh, and then she moved into writing, uh, anthropology, and today she combines both her tech and her writing skills to research uh, biotechnology, people, data, and consults institutions like the BBC, the UK Ethical Data, to make sure that um, the, uh, um, the interest of people, of the uh, research, is uh, of high integrity. So please welcome Lydia to the stage. Uh, hi, yeah, so, um, so I'm an anthropologist, which a lot of the time people think means that I work with stone tools like this most of the day, but I actually focus more on the interaction between human identity and ethics and bodies and data. And, uh, and one of the jobs that I've got right now is that I'm a senior researcher in collective intelligence at a charity called Nesta that looks at uh, innovation and new technologies for social good. So a lot of the time it's my job to kind of look at new technologies and think about both the opportunities but also the different kinds of uh, issues and potential ethical concerns that might affect our choices. So today I want to talk about intelligence uh, and particularly about tools and how interacting with tools, uh, especially tools that think back, uh, can bring about shifts in our processes of thinking. The way that we decide and we debate, that we discover things, that we value things, the way that we understand each other and ourselves. So of course, humans have used tools for longer than we have even been human. Uh, these are a couple of hundred thousand years old. They're about the earliest stone tools. And uh, tools have always meant more than just their practical purpose. They have always represented expanded skills and power. We know that at the same time that people were making the earliest stone tools, they also made giant versions that could never have been practically used, possibly for worship, for, for some kind of understanding that the tool is more than just an object. And now, of course, the tools that we use all day think back. So my work tends to involve uh, thinking a lot about how these tools think back. So I've, I've been a developer. I've built systems to digitize a 200-year-old business. I've built information architecture for TV companies who are trying to plan their schedules, which is bizarre to think now because I haven't had to schedule a TV slot for years. Um, and. Uh, I've been trying to work with scientists to see how they use different kinds of tools to make decisions and understand their data. Uh, and in all of this, I'm continually shocked by how uh, the power of tools to shape our thinking, but also the, the naivety or the innocence sometimes that we come to those tools. Even people that are incredibly smart, who know how to code, who have sometimes built their own platforms, they don't think about their vulnerability to the bias in systems. They don't think about the menu option that is deliberately not included. They don't think about how Facebook decided what a friendship should look like. They don't think about uh, why when I look on my, I turn on my phone at the end of a night out and try and see where else there might be to go next, Google decides to put in adverts of the places that I spend the most money rather than the places, say, you know, somewhere nice to sit down in the quiet, uh, the, or free art shows or other kinds of options. So it feels like this is quite an urgent point to get people to think about. Uh, we need to be thinking more about the terrible and wonderful adaptive adaptability of our brains, the way that we can change and expand ourselves. Uh, so it's quite a big kind of ask, but um, essentially the question is, when I get my jetpack, what will my jetpack mean? I, a jetpack is more than a jetpack. It, might represent to you freedom, nostalgia. It might be a symbol of power, or maybe for an environmentalist, it's a terrible representation of waste. And all of those things, those meanings shift over time. And I want to think not only about how I might value a jetpack, but how future me might value a jetpack. 
because it's not me that's going to be playing with all these technologies, but one of these kind of versions of me, the, the one that might have aged or been uploaded into the singularity, and they probably have very different priorities than I do. Their whole idea of how the world works might be different. Uh, future me definitely doesn't look very happy about the world. I don't know why that is. Because we, we tend to overestimate the kind of short-term impact that new technologies make, but we underestimate the long-term changes because we forget that when we use tools, those tools recreate us as people. Will artificial intelligence take over the world? No, not in any way that we understand. It is spectacularly unimaginative uh, to think about that this new alien kind of intelligence we're developing is gonna wake up on a Thursday morning and decide that it wants to start a, a land war in Asia. Instead, it's gonna happen in a very different way. It's already happening. It's auto-completing our questions, our movements, where we go and what we see. It's changing some of the most important decisions that we might make. About half of the married partners in America met on an online dating site like this. It, their decision was supported by an algorithm. So machines for decades now have been already selectively breeding humans, essentially. And we know that using dating sites really changes how our relationships form. They, on a dating site, people are much more likely to entrench and stick to barriers of class, of religion, of race. Romeo and Juliet would never meet on OkCupid okay because they would set their filters to exclude the mortal enemies of their families. Uh, but technologies don't just change the structure of our most intimate relationships. Uh, they also change how we think and the very structure of our brains. Uh, our brains are superb delegators. As soon as humans learned to write, they forgot to store entire epic sagas in their heads. They were able to develop longer and more complex stories, uh, to have conversations across centuries, to extend the reach of artistic and intellectual life. Uh, but we don't just extend ourselves with tools, we make trade-offs. So um, these are the brain scans of London black cab drivers. Uh, in case you didn't know, uh, a London taxi driver has to pass one of the most difficult exams in the world. Uh, it's called the knowledge and it takes two years. They, uh, they drive around on mopeds trying to learn the layout of the, entire of, of the entirety of London. They have to learn all of the twisting streets, one of the most tangled up and uh, completely nonsensically designed and older cities in the world. And we know that over the course of those two years, uh, the hippocampi there, which controls our spatial memory, uh, the front of the hippocampi grows, uh, whereas the back of the hi hippocampi, which is, uh, wait, it's the other way around. Uh, the, yeah, the one that works on visual memory uh, uh, changes. So at the beginning, uh, at the end of, the of two years of studying these maps, they actually perform worse on certain kinds of spatial uh, memory tasks of matching different objects because their brain has made a trade-off of swelling to learn all of these streets and having a better spatial memory, but not having as good a visual memory. So they've, they've done that. The, the great thing that I always like is that it really doesn't matter if that is a scan of a taxi driver's brain because there's a lot of studies that show that you'll think that my talk is more relevant and, in and intelligent because there's a scan of a brain in it. It doesn't matter if it's the right brain, um, but it is the right brain. And of course, so this is a taxi driver's brain, I promise, uh, but an Uber driver, they make a very different kind of set of judgments. They don't need to learn the map of London, but they do need to juggle a constantly changing price and surging index about where there might be different customers and making lots of decisions that way. And uh, we know as well, as was mentioned in the intro, that using Google, using search, very much changes how we deal with information in our own brains. As soon as we have access to online storage that has a search function, we tend to stop remembering the specifics of information and instead we remember how to access it. Uh, we get much better at that uh, remembering how to access and we get worse at remembering specifics. And uh, as te technologies grow, uh, you learn how little you can get away with. So I knew that that paper existed, 
but I couldn't remember the title, so that's all that I needed to put in, and there's the paper. Uh, and a lot of these changes are more profound. They change the structure of how we think about the world in invisible ways. Uh, for instance, uh, a big thing that gets mentioned here a lot is the future. We're talking about the future in a very specific way. We tend to be talking about the future as this unknowable thing that might accelerate or change incredibly fast. But that isn't the way that the future has always been understood. For most of human history, people have thought that they lived not at the end of time, about to fall off, uh, but right in the middle. Uh, so medieval Christians all over Europe, uh, they, tended to, they knew that the future involved uh, the return of their God, the judgment and the harrowing of hell. Uh, for them, history had been thoroughly spoiled. They could assume that for the next century or so, uh, technology of a cart wouldn't really change, and neither would the social order. So it made sense for me as a wheelwright to lay down wood to cure in time for my grandson, because nothing would change in that time. Our identities wouldn't change. Uh, and so they performed this, uh, this continuation, this uh, stability of time, every year when they put on the mystery plays, which were plays about different Bible studies. Every year, guilds would perform the same story. A father replaces a son, replaced by a grandson. Over time, the culture, the technology, the social system, they're all entangled in a way of thinking about the world that is actually very, very different from how we think about time now. The idea that, say, we want our kids to do better than we have, that's quite a new idea. Uh, the model of, of a, fu a future that's racing away, that inspires a kind of fear and an urgency that's very, very useful to advertisers. And they can promise that a new touchscreen toenail clipper and a Bluetooth pillow, they might be able to help you as you're moving out into this unknown, scary future. But it's really terrible for people that want to invest in the long term. The Romans built for millennia, for thousands of years. The Victorians built for centuries. Uh, but the buildings that are going up now in Dubai, they have a life expectancy of a couple of decades. Those towers are not expected to live more than 15 years. And that's terrible motivation for us to fix anything or change anything in society, to do much that isn't thinking about apocalypse stories and marble civil war, explosions everywhere. Because that's easier to think about than the kind of big changes in society that we might need. So these shifts in perception, uh, they reach into really deep, uh, intimate ways of understanding ourselves. Uh, they slide in between feeling and understanding. So uh, to give you, a, to give you a, an example of these kind of abs abstract changes, so a lot of my work is in health, so I'll go there. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the, the UK government was worried that the children in schools were so uh, were in such bad health that, that they soon wouldn't have enough recruits for the Boer War, for the war that they had going on at the time. So they introduced an Education Act that meant that there were periodic medical inspections in schools. So for the first time, nurses and doctors went into schools and checked uh, that children were growing right. They tracked their, um, their growth, their weight, checked them for diseases. For the first time, a child's health no longer consisted of whether she felt sick but, or whether she couldn't come to school or couldn't do the things they wanted to do, but instead was being matched against a statistical curve. See, I told you all we can think about now is apocalypse. It's great. Um, so for the first time, as you're tracking your health against other people's health, uh, you're creating a risk society in a, a risk version of health. And then when you start thinking about health as something that is relative or risky, you never get to be well. Uh, you're always having to work to remain well. If there's a curve of who's healthy and who's not, you have to work constantly to stay on the upper end of that because what is defined as healthy is constantly changing. Behaviors that are considered healthy one week might not be the next. And your averages, your expectations, the general level of health, that might change. And if that goes up, even if you stay still, you've become less healthy overall. And this, this is you know, what risk society looks like. It's the idea that you have a risk and you have to manage it. Uh, even though a lot of the things that make you at risk of certain health things aren't something that you can change at all. They're generally about 
you being over over 50 or stressed or poor diet. So a lot of the time, they're things that if you have a low income, you can't do much about. And so over that 100 years, the idea of what health is has changed from the opposite of illness uh, instead to something that you can't see or feel, that you aren't allowed to know yourself. Instead, it's something in an ever-shifting kind of array of numbers and patterns. Uh, and often now, as it gets more and more complex, it's something that isn't something you can understand without access uh, to big data analysis or to the right apps or tools. So we learn not to trust ourselves. We learn not to trust our own intuitive understanding of our body. Uh, so I did a lot of uh, research on this. I interviewed people about how they felt about their health. And as you can see, like a lot of these, they're programmers mostly, and a lot of them said that they felt more comfortable with the hard certainty of numbers than anything to do with their understanding of their own body. Uh, which I find super interesting and as well makes you think about all of the aspects of health that are very much more difficult to measure, the ideas of how healthy your relationships are, how happy you are, these kind of things. These people as well, they're doing pretty well. A lot of them, they can afford the time to collect the data. They can afford the data collection systems. They're pretty good at programming. So they have the chance to interact with this system from quite a position of power. Uh, but of course, as this kind of data pours in from their bodies into the health system, there's a lot of people that can't afford to do that kind of work. And so they become more and more invisible. Uh, so the way that the different ways that we're interacting with these kind of data tools, they fundamentally change our bodies. But can they also change our identities, what it means to be a human, what it means to be a person in this culture? Uh, I think that in a lot of these systems, uh, using a lot of these systems can really change your idea of what it means to be me, what it means to be an individual. So in the West, generally starting from the Enlightenment, we have a very individualistic view of identity. Uh, there's the idea of there's an individual with individual rights, they make individual choices, and they have responsibilities, uh, including the choice to fail. Uh, but in a lot of other cultures, there is an identity that overlaps more. Uh, so you might be one of a family, and that is more important than your individual identity, your individual choices. And when those kind of relational identities, these family identities, um, get tangled up with really patriarchal or misogynistic cultures, you get examples where, say, a woman becomes an extension of her father or husband. Um, her chastity, her virginity is the same thing as her father's strength. Um, and, and his correctness in society. So this is from a film about uh, honor killings, which a friend of mine wrote. It was on the BBC recently, and it's really amazing. Uh, it looks very much at the idea of how an entire family becomes a unit. And if one person tries to make a different choice, uh, that can have a massive impact on uh, other members of her family. And we tend to think of these kind of ideas, these kind of relationships as being very old fashioned, as being very kind of very tribal. But actually, that's something that we're seeing more and more on different kinds of social media. I mean, my Facebook profile is made up mostly of things that other people did or said about me, photos they took and tagged me in, ways that they've liked or commented on my posts. Uh, their decisions, other people in my social group's decisions. My Twitter feed is entirely full of retweets. Uh, you, you can see how successful I am on that by whether other people have decided to like or follow or whatever. Um, and that's how I get a lot of my, my work, how I get real friends. So all of that really becomes something that someone else is doing. For me, that's fine, but for a lot of people, that can be very dangerous. Uh, for instance, it matters to someone who has a conservative family if a friend of theirs tags them attending gay pride. Uh, there's some really, really good examples of problems for people trying to apply for American colleges where they tend to look at your social media profile. And let's say that you're someone from a very poor area, from an ethnic minority. Um, one of the, the uses that uh, Dana Boyd uses is, is of young black American men who are applying to college, and they're expected by these colleges to produce a really clean-cut, high-achieving identity. But their neighbors, their families, their schoolmates, 
they've also got their own ideas of what that person should be. And so they're posting stuff on their wall, they're, they're tagging them in photos, and there's this massive clash um, between the different kinds of people that you want to be. But for Facebook, they want to merge all of your identities together. Um, in many ways, that, that just makes that just entrenches old divides. If you're from a very high achieving or a well-off background, the things that are posted, the things that leak into your identity pull you upwards, whereas it's possible in other situations for you to be pulled away from places that might have resources and opportunities like college. Um, and in China, this is becoming explicit. So this is Sesame Credit. Uh, in China, you're, this is a new social credit system so you are ranked, your credit is ranked, not just by your financial uh, transactions, your social media profile, your arrest records and your career, but by those of your friends. So the people that they know, the things that they do, the stuff that they say, which means that now in China, cutting off that cousin that sometimes posts to Weibo about government corruption, uh, if you cut them off, then it's going to be much easier for you to rent a car or get a visa to Singapore, which are the things that social credit gets you right now. So you can see on those kind of platforms that our identities, the idea of what we are, becomes more and more leaky. We become increasingly responsible for other people's opportunities and ways of being in the world. It makes it much harder to be separate, uh, to maintain different faces in different places. Uh, and these systems that we use to, uh, to connect with each other, to manage our health data, they're growing more and more complex and intelligent. They support us in connecting in more and more complicated ways. We know that Facebook needs to be smart to make interactions between a billion people meaningful, but we don't think day to day about how they're changing, what we're seeing, why certain posts are at the tops. So these support tools, they're great, but they need to be investigated and critiqued. We need to educate people more about the different kinds of things that they're slipping in. Because humans are so brilliantly adaptable that they're also very vulnerable. In any relationship where one person or one thing is really rigid and the other is really flexible, it's the flexible one that tends to make the compromises. And humans are inherently vastly more flexible and able to make wonderful compromises and workarounds than machines are. So we're the ones that tend to be making the changes. And it's not the people that had the power to design the systems that are doing that. It's, uh, it's the people that might be, that, that are using them. Uh, and the people that are designing these systems are really not very shy about their ambitions uh, to, to change us, to capitalize on that adaptability. Um, so there's a quick thing. I, so this is a poem that, uh, or it's an extract from a poem that makes me think about this quite a lot. Uh, the idea of the space between thought and action. We know that there's a lot of biases. There's a lot of stuff going on between the idea that you might want to do something and it actually taking place. Uh, there's all sorts of unspoken desires that can be advertised to and encouraged. There's all sorts of emotional responses that can be manipulated. Unspoken assumptions, implicit biases that can be built into platforms and constrain us. Uh, that's this, the idea that there is a space between our thoughts and what we actually do, our, our rational idea of who we are and what we actually manage to do in the world, that's a space that's really open to being exploited. It's very, it's very easy for, to be colonized. Uh, and there's this, this work has gone on in the um, recent work on the latest EU uh, data, protective, data protection directive, um, where there's been a real legal challenge about the fact that if, if you're, things like predictive policing, things like uh, predictive selling, they undermine our integrity as an individual. Uh, because if I might risk, if I, the idea that there's a very high chance that I'm gonna commit a crime, you act as if I've already done it. Uh, the idea is that that's, that's very wrong. Intention is not action. Uh, I might be very likely to do something, but if you act to stop me, then you're undermining my choice uh, to act, maybe in a way you don't want me to, and to accept the consequences. And that's very important for the rule of law. So Amazon recently patented uh, the idea of posting goods to people before they've actually clicked buy. It tends to be like they'll post it to the depot nearest to you. So just the very, the, the percentage likelihood that you might click on something 
they already, if it's high enough, they already begin to ship it to you so that it's nearer to you uh, in preparation for you buying it, which kind of means that they're, they're trying to predict my latent, my internal desires before I have the chance to articulate them, to make them real, to, to demonstrate my intentionality, which I kind of need to be a real individual adult person. Um, and what they really want is to not only be able to predict my uh, desires, but also to encourage the ones that suit them. Maybe I have a desire to save money, but they definitely don't want me to think about that. So, yeah, most people know that Facebook said the first one of these, uh, the idea that people have gotten really comfortable with sharing this information. But I always get more fascinated with the second bit, where he quite explicitly says, uh, I, you know, he quite explicitly says that this was deliberate. Uh, we decided that this would be the norm, and we just went for it. This is designed into the system. He wants you to think about privacy in a different way, so he's designed the system that way. It's a new norm, a new way of thinking that really suits Facebook, because Facebook wants to collapse all of your different identities, all of the different private ways of being, where you might be different with your grandmother, than your colleagues, than with your workmates, um, with your friends. Uh, <laughs> that. To them, it's best if they can collapse all of these so that they can sell to all of the different bits of you to be really effective there. Um, Eric Schmidt, similarly, uh, he wants a world where Google is entirely entangled with your consciousness. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need some kind of singularitarian shift to get all of this. This is just about controlling the platforms on which you do all of your everyday activities. They want to know what you're thinking about. They want to make sure that they know where you're going and they can mean that you never get lost, you never get lonely, you're never bored. But maybe we want, maybe it's good for us to sometimes be lonely or lost or bored. Um, I at least want to have the choice. And the fact is that like Google says you're never out of ideas, you're never out of ideas that suit them. So this came up when I was trying to write on this topic. Um, Google has a very strong idea of what they want you to think, and they want you to think not about dystopias or the possibility that anything could go wrong, but a beautiful, happy utopia. I assure you this is 100% real. I could have photoshopped it, but wouldn't I have made it a higher resolution if I had? So like, what can we do in this sort of situation? What kind of choices do we have? I, I think that most of the tools that we're using, they're amazing, they're great opportunities. I just want people to be more thoughtful, more cautious, more smart about the decisions that they're making. Because you can decide not to accept auto-completed sentences, auto-completed jokes. Uh, we can try and accept the fact that we have wonderful plural identities that don't always fit together, consolidated under single names to be more convenient to be sold to. Uh, even if when they're trying to predict our desires, they, uh, no, where is it? No. OK, that's a screenshot of Amazon trying to sell me anthropology wine, which of course isn't a real thing, but they know that what I buy is alcohol and books about anthropology. So they desperately tried to work out if that could be a real thing and they could sell it to me. So they, they constructed a big data advert. Um, but it's not there because PowerPoint doesn't like it. But anyway, uh, a lot of these tools are useful. We just have to think about them. Uh, in my recent work at Nesta, we've been doing this, we've been attacking this problem from a lot of angles. We're working with the UK government to develop all sorts of data ethics frameworks, uh, different tools to work with the public so that they get educated about these issues and can be smarter about the kind of choices they make. Uh, we brought together legal philosophers and civil servants and computer scientists and regulators all to think about this more, to build tools that help us understand it. Uh, and as well, we've tried to create some art. We've had a series of, um, of stories developed with sci-fi authors and with academics working together to try and think about new ways that we could think, uh, like quite, quite literally what are new ways of thinking that we haven't thought of yet. It gets quite complicated. Uh, and we've got a series of writing there, so uh, just head to nested.org.uk if you want to see that. Because the fact is if we leave things up to the, the bots, um, so this, this is a book about surviving bankruptcy, and those are real prices on offer by Amazon, uh, because there are two bots that are trying to sell you something uh, at one penny more than the next person. Uh, if they can see that that thing has free shipping, then they'll offer it to you with a better rating uh, and buy it from them and sell it to you for a, a profit of one penny. But when two of those bots interact, 
they end up trying to sell you a, a book on bankruptcy for several million dollars. Uh, because there's just a lot of these systems, they're very, very good at what they do, but they've got some biases built in. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a recurring theme in the kind of work that I do is that we need to be thinking more boldly and creatively about the ways that we might work together to not accept just the different patterns of thinking that are handed down to us by the most powerful social media uh, organizations. So I like this as well. This is Ursula Le Guin. She's one of my favorite sci-fi authors. And she called for us to create more bold art, to think about other ways of thinking. She talks about capitalism and its power being inescapable, but I think this extends to all sorts of ways of thinking. Um, are there better ways that we might be interacting and thinking about friendship and connection, social connections, than LinkedIn? I think we can do better than LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, they're calling for art. We're creating some stuff at Nesta, trying to some practical tools as well as some art. I'd be really interested in think in hearing about what you guys are doing. Um, I've seen a lot of amazing stuff here that uh, has been about different ways of tackling problems, and uh, I look forward to talking to you about how we can imagine better worlds. I think that's me. Nice. I have uh, I have a question for you. Yeah. I want you to make it uh, really, really, really pessimistic. Really pessimistic. So what you've sketched is that maybe they know they make you buy things, but could you sketch us a very black uh, doomsday scenario of what is the extreme we can take it? Because I'm not, I'm still like okay. Yeah. It's cool if Amazon sends it to my yeah. to my house. See, that's okay. Um, but give me so what some could of the happen stuff in the worst so case. So in, in America, they don't have as many protections as we have in the EU. So predictive policing is already taking off. There are quite a few cities where as soon as you call up um, at, at the emergency services, by the time that they come in, uh, they... They've seen a rating of your address. It scanned all of your social media networks and worked out you know, who you're connected to, who you talk to, and who else has lived there, um, and give you a, a alert rating, green, yellow, or red. And that makes a real impact on whether they come into your house with a gun out or with a smile on their face. Um, and when this was tested at, a, at a, a town hall event, one of the councillors had it run on his name. He lived in a poor area, and he came up as a red flag even though he was a community volunteer his whole life. And they realized that in a lot of these poorer areas, because people move through addresses more rapidly, you're, you're being profiled to be higher risk. So there's, and there was a, a story just a week ago about how the, the profiles for whether people would commit crimes again as they came, when they're coming out of prison, they found that it was not just incredibly racist, but completely inaccurate. So it was it was much more likely to tell you that uh, black criminals were likely to commit more crimes, and they would predict wrongly that white criminals would not commit more crimes. So they got it wrong both ways, in both directions. And it was only 20% accurate overall. So a lot of these things, they're, they're trying, it's okay for it to autocomplete my sentence from utopia to dystopia, but they're trying to autocomplete people's lives. And that's okay for, those of us that grow up in a place, in a situation where we can access education, where maybe we come from a relatively high income, or we have educated parents, or we have things like that. But if you start off with less advantages, you don't want your life auto-completed. You don't want people to assume that your life is going to go one certain way. So I think a lot of the time these things, they change our life choices, and they also make, in the, in the look, work on health, I thought it was very sad that people wouldn't count anything about their health that couldn't be measured in data. I thought it was, it was quite upsetting, really, that people wouldn't tell you anything about whether they'd enjoyed going on that run. They would only tell you about you know, the, num the number that they'd hit, whereas people yeah. that didn't capture the data would tell you about whether they had a good day or a good session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Let's see if there are any questions in the room. <laughs> okay, then so I, have a, yeah. I have another one. Is um, I, I don't know, maybe that's me, but mm. um, 
for example, when I when I chose what to study, mm. it was totally random. Yeah. Well, I knew I wanted engineering. Um, and I went for the shiny car and mm -hmm. it happened to be aerospace engineering and there yeah, was like yeah. a nice car on the website yeah and maybe you know like electrical engineering or uh, or uh, mechanical engineering would have been a better choice mm. with this auto completion yeah well see that's there's always gonna be a degree of randomness I, I think like when I was picking universities, I went for the one where it was sunny that day. I yeah. still think, like I, I'm glad of the one that I chose, but yeah. I went to three or four, and it's England, so most of the time it's raining. But the one where it was sunny and beautiful, that's yeah. the one that I picked. So maybe you're advocating for randomness. Well, randomness is, like I like the, uh, randomness enhances our lives a bit. Like you don't know if things could have gone one way or the other. What I don't like is when the odds are being shifted in favor of people that already have a lot of power, because that, that means that we can't see new systems or new ways of thinking emerging. You know, it, it shifts us to thinking that maybe Facebook and Google are the only way to go, maybe, whereas a new network, a new sort of way of organizing ourselves. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, we have a gift for you. Oh, grand. Uh, please give a big applause to uh, Lydia. You know now why you should watch out with Facebook. <laughs> uh, One more reason. And Google. So we have a oh. tent for you. Oh, I have a tent. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you. And tent. see you all at the next lecture. Thank you.